And even though it says that I'm from the University of Chicago, this year I'm spending in Germany. And uh, Bernard Führer, the professor of traditional Chinese literature at SOAS, invited me to give um, a series of lectures there called the Angus Graham Lectures that um, probably the, the most uh, prominent um, scholar, Western scholar of Chinese intellectual history in the second half of the 20th century was Angus Graham, uh, who passed away about 1990. And five or six years ago, they established a series of lectures to, uh, to celebrate the work and life of Angus Graham. So I was invited to give those lectures, and through that met Ellie, and she said, oh, well, I'm a member of the Oriental Club, and wouldn't it be lovely if we could have, we could establish a series of talks on China, because she knew that there were also talks on India and so forth, and asked if I would be the, the first of these speakers. Um, I said, well, um, Yes, perhaps, but only if I can bring my family, because uh, um, I have, I'm in, in Germany with my wife and two daughters, um, and my youngest daughter is now 15, but she was, she was last here, the only time she was in London was when she was five years old, and I remember walking around all of downtown London with her on my shoulders, and she was fast asleep. Um, so this time, we came back and, and we stayed in Ellie's flat for a week. And they, uh, they just they left yesterday. A party for the Prospies who were coming in and working, working for the firm. No, I think that's not. But there, there is actually some philological background to that kind of a, a, a title. But then new evidence for what the E.J. might originally have meant. And this is what Ellie is particularly interested in, the E. Jing, the classic of changes. It's the first of the Chinese classics. It's, in some respects, the oldest text in China, uh, not necessarily in all respects, but, but in some respects it is. Um, and it really is the foundation of much of Chinese thought. Indeed, I just went down and grabbed out of the entry well, uh, the stairwell there. I don't know how many of you noticed it on the way up, but um, this is half of what's known as a, a linked uh, couplet from uh, Chinese poetry. Chinese calligraphy, this happens to be the season of Chinese New Year's. We're, we're what, now about four, four days into Chinese New Year's. Um, and it says that spring, and this is when Chinese New Year's initiates the season of spring, even if it's February, even if it's January, it's still <laughs> the beginning of spring, is full of Qian and Kun. And Blessings fill our, our door, our gate. What are these Chen and Kun? These are the first two hexagrams of the I Jing. Uh, they are the pure male and pure female hexagrams. Um, but in this, in this kind of a context, that spring is filling the males and females, of course, uh, that's when we begin to feel our oats, so to speak, so that by fall we might have some offspring. Um, and, and there is there is some of that involved in, in the aging, none of which I'm going to talk about today. <laughs> um, and for those of you who don't want to listen, you can tune out. There's not going to be, there won't be very many pretty pictures on display. Uh, it would be more Chinese characters than anything else. But I, I'm going to try and make it at least uh, slightly entertaining. Um, and the, the, the 
first two hexagrams. <coughs> the I Ching is made up of 64 different pictures of either solid or broken lines. And so two to the sixth comes out to 64. And that's considered to be sort of a sum <coughs> of all the possible um, situations that humans might find themselves in. Uh, the first two, of course, the most general, male and female. Each of these 64 hexagrams is made up then of six lines that have uh, statements attributed to the lines. And they change from line to line. And that's why the I Ching is known in the West as the classic of changes or the book of changes. That why, when we get ourselves into a particular situation, might we find that it's then going to change? So that life is never stable, and that makes some sense. Four characters of the uh, of the Ijin. Jun is a word that we we now know most commonly in Chinese as part of the word for a virgin. Uh, a young woman who has not been violated yet. Uh, but it also means resolve, it means um, determination, something like that. But an earlier meaning of that word was to perform a divination. And we've often heard that the I Ching was saved from the fires of the first emperor of China who was burning all the books because it was a practical book. It was a book of divination. And so they didn't burn the E.J. Mm -hmm. Now, I, uh, Chris, I thought you were going to sit in the last room. You told me that. <laughs> no, uh, no, I'm still hiding. One of, our, one of our guests who's going to climb into the fire um, uh, is the great grandson, right? The eldest son of the eldest son of the <laughs> eldest son of yeah, James Lang, who was the first professor of Chinese at Oxford. He uh, uh, he went to the Orient, I think, in 1839. Uh, arrived in Hong Kong in 1842. Was there until 1873. He produced numerous translations of Chinese text. Uh, so the Chinese classics were, were done, for the most part, while he was in Hong Kong. As the, <clears throat> I, I'm not, I, I, I had a, a Catholic upbringing, so Protestants just don't really register with me. But he was the Reformed Church of Scotland. Right. Um, Nonconformist, but nonconformist. I, okay. Uh, in any event, was the bishop of Hong Kong um, during I think the entire time he was there, 1842 to 1870. He went when he returned to Germany. He uh, he, he very famously became associated with the psychologist uh, Carl Jung. And in the, uh, the German, the, the first edition of Wilhelm's translation of the Ijing, there was a, uh, a preface by Carl Jung who said that the Ijing taps into this universal subconsciousness of which Jung talked. In the uh, 1940s, uh, a, a young lady, a young American woman, who was a fan of Jung's uh, and who had very good German, uh, was given the task of translating uh, Richard Wilhelm's German translation of the I Ching into English. And this was eventually published by Princeton University Press in the 19, I think, late 1940s or early 1950s. For about 30 years, it had the, uh, the prestige of being the best-selling English line, uh, best-selling university press book in America. Uh, in the preface to it, 
Uh, he talks about the, the history of his own involvement with the text, um, and, and he says that it's, it's a little confusing because there are some appendixes to the I Ching that were supposed to have been written by Confucius. So Confucius lived in the 6th century BC. But there's another way to translate it. There, there are many different ways to translate those four characters. Um, some of you may know the I Ching, the classic of changes, through the translation of Richard Wilhelm, who uh, was a German, he was also a missionary. He was a German missionary who arrived in China in 1899 and was living in the German protectorate of Qingdao. Uh, he kind of went native. He basically gave up his Christian faith and he established the Confucian Society of Qingdao uh, and became a, a very prominent translator of Chinese classics. But the most, the most important of his translations was of the I Ching, which he completed in 1922. Eventually, there was an astronomer, not an astrologer, but an astronomer, who uh, uh, was on American public television, Carl Sagan, who did this, this series on the cosmos. And his book, I forget which press published it, but eventually outsold Richard Wilhelm's E. J. translation. But it, it was a translation that maybe some of you traveled around Europe hitchhiking and backpacking. And I, I've been told by many people that the, the Wilhelm Bain the woman who translated it into English was Carrie F. Baines. Um, the Wilhelm Baines translation was in their backpack, and every night before, or every morning before they did anything, they would do a divination to find out whether it would be propitious or not. Um, and in any event, this, the Wilhelm, Wilhelm's translation of the I Ching has played an even greater role in the Western appreciation of the classical changes than James Legge's translation. And in the introduction to uh, Wilhelm's translation, it sounds very much like what James Legge says he was going to do. This is what is the Book of Changes actually in order to arrive at an understanding of the book and its teachings, we must first of all boldly strip away the dense overgrowth of interpretations that have read into it all sorts of extraneous ideas. Uh, this is equally necessary whether we're dealing with the superstitions and mysteries of old Chinese sorcerers or the no less superstitious theories of modern European scholars who try to interpret all historical cultures in terms of their experience of primitive savages. Of course, that's, that's a dig at anthropologists. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and he says, we must hold here to the fundamental principle that the Book of Changes is to be explained in the light of its own content and of the era to which it belongs. Um, who is, is at the British Museum today? Uh, this is pictograph of a tripod, a, uh, a round vessel with two ears on it that you put a pole through, and three legs coming down. And it's pronounced Dane, whereas <laughs> this character over here, when it says this way is pronounced Chum, they don't sound alike in modern Chinese. In fact, in ancient Chinese, they sound very much alike. Both of them sound something like Tian. Um, and then we have a word family that we can draw up around this that's actually a, a pretty interesting word family. It would certainly repay the efforts of some enterprising graduate student or postdoc. Um, all of these words have the meaning of being upright. And believe it or not, perhaps you folks in England can still believe this. We in America can't. <laughs> the government is supposed to be upright. 
right. <laughs> and if it's not upright, it at least is supposed to make the people who are governed upright. Um, and these words that have this kind of pronunciation, it, it comes from a nail. The original pictograph is a nail head, things that secure, make something secure. In fact, we even have a, a word for uh, editing a text is correcting, making it correct. And so all of these words have the same sense. They were all pronounced the same in ancient Chinese. And that's what jut, this word that I said, is also a word for a virgin. It's most common usage in modern Chinese is for a girl who is chaste. C-H-A-S-T-E rather than C-H-A-S-E-D, although she may be C-H-A-S-E-D as well. Um, and in the classic of changes, this word appears, uh, it's not the most frequent word in the whole text, but it's one of the most frequent words. And, and it occurs very frequently. Is it beneficial to determine beneficial to perform a divination, or is it beneficial to be determined, to be upright? And I suppose that's sort of the crux of the debate between a Richard Wilhelm, who translates it, it furthers to be firm, or Richard Kunst, who would translate it as a beneficial determination. Or me, I say it's beneficial to perform a divination. Um, so it's uh, uh, other, other things here. Uh, determination auspicious. Does that mean to be determined is something good? Or does it mean, having performed divination, the prognostication is auspicious? You can imagine that people who want to strip away the veneer of the anthropological interpretation and go back to 1000 BC say that this is all about divination. And so the, the divination is auspicious. Those people who want to read the classic of changes as a book of wisdom for the ages would interpret it as to be determined is auspicious. One ought to be firm in its <coughs> approach to. Uh, uh, to uh, but the uh, I, I think the point ought to be sufficiently clear that there are these two kinds of interpretations. One that seeks to go back to the origin of the text, to place the text in its context of 1000 BC and as a divination man. You know, whether this is folklore or how we should interpret it, um, but there's it's a pre-philosophical text. Or if we should regard it as the, the work of Confucius himself, who has taken these original folk sayings, such as, read in the night a sailor's delight, and turned it into a philosophical maxim that, you know, I don't know what we could do with read in the night a sailor's delight, but probably um, uh, the sailor ought to be careful in the night so as not to contract some sort of disease from being too, um, uh, too delighted by being a virgin. Is it, is it, is it kind of idea behind it that uh, what's being revealed is something perfect, which is going to tell you about the future or the, what's going to happen? I, it, it only means virgin when it comes before the character for woman. So used as an adjective for a woman, it is an upright woman. And, and many of, many of the, uh, the meanings of this, would, of this particular character, 
would be best translated as upright. And it comes from these cauldrons, tripods, and of course a tripod is the uh, is, is the sort of thing that is is most stable, right? Because even if you have one leg that is shorter than the other two legs, it will still be stable on on the ground. Whereas if you have a four-legged thing and there's one leg that's shorter than the other, it will rock. So a tripod throughout Chinese tradition has represented firmness, being upright. It's also been, there's, there's a long tradition that the earliest dynasties were represented by having nine of these tripods. And when they would move from one dynasty to another, that represented the legitimacy of the new dynasty. So with, with the idea of a virgin, it is the same thing that we would say is an upright woman. Um, so she's, um, she's correct. So it doesn't have, have anything particularly to do with, with the female aspect at all, except when it's used as an adjective.